Well, thank you for the introduction. And uh, to get started right away, a phylogeny is just an evolutionary tree. And in this schematic, we see a picture of a rooted binary tree with four species at the leaves. And this schematic indicates that human is more closely related to chimpanzee than to either gorilla or orangutan. Now, there's this famous quote that says, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And besides uh, reconstructing the tree of life, there are many downstream applications to large-scale phylogeny estimation. And if I haven't gotten you excited about large genomic data sets and the tree of life, then keep in mind that this talk is really about how do you take an algorithm that is not embarrassingly parallel and come up with a uh, approach to solving this problem that will work on systems like Blue Waters. And at the end, we'll present some results and talk about future work. Okay, so in particular, by evolution, today we're talking about molecular evolution. And if you look at the root of this tree, there's an ancestral DNA uh, sequence and evolutionary events are going to occur, and then we're going to observe the genetic sequences today. Uh -oh. <laughs> All right, so uh, basically our task is to take this DNA that is on the leaves and to reconstruct this tree. Now, phylogeny estimation uh, is a whole pipeline process and it begins with sequences of unequal lengths, and then we want to begin by aligning them. So this first step shows a pairwise alignment, and it indicates certain events, like here there's a substitution, so C mutated into G, or vice versa, and then this indicates an insertion or deletion event, so C or T were either deleted or inserted. And ultimately, a lot of pipelines actually want something called a multiple sequence alignment, where all four sequences are aligned together and they create this data matrix from which we will estimate a tree. And in terms of estimating a tree, there's a lot of different approaches to do this. And one of them are these distance methods to which the input is a matrix and every element in the matrix ij indicates the distance between a sequence i and a sequence j. And if you already have a multiple sequence alignment, then you can look at two uh, aligned sequences and compute this distance. But there's other uh, alignment-free methods to computing these pairwise distances that are embarrassingly parallel. And so distance methods will give you a tree with branch lengths, and it's important to note that these methods uh, use polynomial time, so that is a very desirable property. But really, one of the gold standards in phylogeny estimation is maximum likelihood methods. And for these types of methods, the input is a multiple sequence alignment, and the output is a model tree uh, which maximizes the probability that you observe that uh, multiple sequence alignment given that model tree. And it's important to note that the ML tree estimation problem is NP hard, but regardless, uh, the heuristic methods for solving this problem are still typically more accurate uh, than distance methods, especially under some challenging model conditions. So this is a really desirable method to use. Now, as we talked about multiple sequence alignment, these data matrices have two dimensions, N and L. And when we talk about L, this is not such a terrible dimension to be long because a likelihood is actually computed over the tree at each column in the alignment independently. And so you can take your alignment, you can divide it into chunks along the L dimension, and you have parallelism there. But if you have a very large number of sequences or species, then the parallelism gets more complicated. And to make matters worse, the number of tree topologies is going to increase exponentially with the number of leaves. OK, so if we have a very small l and small n, then there's a lot of different uh, methods that we can use to solve this problem. If we have a reasonable n and a very large l, then there's methods like RAXML and XML that have parallelism across the sites. And if you have large N and not too bad of L, 
then there's some fast heuristic methods you can use. And the space where n and l are large is the space that we want to target and use blue waters to build evolutionary trees. And so that is also the case where you have the tree of life. So I also want to note before moving on that uh, both fast tree 2 and Raxamel have shared memory, memory parallelism. So on blue waters, they'll run out of memory very quickly on a single node. And then XML is distributed memory parallel, but uh, there's this quote from the paper that says it's really limited to around 50,000 taxa, and you're limited to 100 cores on these types of data sets. Because if you imagine an alignment with a much larger n than l, you basically can't divide it up along that l dimension really easily, and so a bunch of your uh, cores are going to be idle. OK, so we basically have realized that we want to break up this n dimension, which is the number of sequences. And there are some divide and conquer approaches to do this. So one of them is called Dactyl from 2012. And it will basically take unaligned sequences, divide them into overlapping subsets. It'll estimate an alignment and then a tree on each of those subsets. And then it will combine all of these trees, which remember have overlapping leaves, uh, by solving the supertree problem, and then this method will iterate. And this approach sounds great, but it's important to note that estimating supertrees is hard. In fact, it's an NP-hard problem under a variety of optimization criteria, and the heuristics to solve this problem don't work well on large data sets. So although we like this approach because it could potentially scale to large n, it doesn't uh, work well in practice. Um, to like very large n. Okay, so basically from this background, we created some design goals. So if we want to build the tree of life on millions of sequences using Blue Waters, then we need to design an algorithm that can utilize a large number of processors, um, dividing the data set both by n um, and with parallelism along the L dimensions. And we basically realized we wanted to avoid building a multiple sequence alignment on the full set of sequences We'll kind of come back to that later. We want to avoid building an ML tree on that full input multiple sequence alignment, and we want to avoid solving the super tree problem. And this is the approach that we came up with. We basically take the dactyl algorithm and we cut out two key steps. So instead, we're going to decompose the sequences into disjoint subsets. So there's no shared leaves on the trees that are built on these disjoint subsets. And then we came up with a new algorithm called tree merge to build these dis or to merge these disjoint trees back together. And we call this algorithm pterodactyl. All right, so to focus in on the tree merge, we're basically gonna take our disjoint subsets and build a minimum spanning tree on them. And so here we'll know if we just look at a small part of this tree, we have subsets i, j, and k, and uh, they're connected by two edges. And now we want to decide if we have a tree TI, a tree TJ, and a tree TK, how can we get a tree TIJK merged across all those subsets? OK, so step two is we want to merge along one edge. So we have trees TI and TJ, and we want to merge them into tree TIJ, such that if you take that merged tree and you constrain it to the leaves from tree I, you recover tree I. And the same would be true if you constrain Tij to the leaves on just Tj. And so we do this by merging the two alignments together. And there's a lot of existing techniques to do this. We then compute a distance matrix on that merged alignment. And we had talked about distance uh, methods previously. And then we run our variant of constrained neighbor joining. And I will show that here. So it basically takes that joined or that merged distance matrix and ti and tj as input, and then it's going to give you this tree, where we basically have now the leaf leaves on ti and tj in one tree, and we use the distance matrix to merge these in a sound fashion because this problem um, would have many solutions, and so we use the distance matrix to get a, a good solution. And then in step three. So we've repeated NJ merge on all of the edges. So we have a TIJ and we have a TJK, and they're shown here. 
And so we notice that Tij and Tjk share Tj. And so we can basically use this information to merge the trees together by using their branch lengths. And so essentially, that's kind of like you look at the path from leaf D to leaf H, and you can do that on both trees, and then you can see what leaves need to be added along that path. OK, so the advantages of pterodactyl is we avoided these three things we had talked about earlier. There's no multiple sequence alignment on everything. There's no maximum likelihood tree on everything. We don't have to solve the super tree estimation problem. And on top of that, tree merge is polynomial time, and it's parallel. So when you have your MST and you go to merge pairs of trees indicated by the edges, you can do all of that merging in parallel, in an embarrassingly parallel fashion. And if you have a very large uh, minimum spanning tree, then you could actually be combining those pairs of trees in parallel uh, on different parts of the MST. Okay. So now we have this approach, and it has all of these desirable features that we wanted. But the question is, is this approach any good? And uh, by performance, biologists would care about the accuracy of the tree that you recover. And so uh, typically what's done here are simulation studies. So we have this true alignment and the true tree. We delete all the gaps from the alignment to get unaligned sequences. And then we could run pterodactyl here to get a tree, or we could estimate an alignment and then estimate a tree. But in summary, we're going to compare the estimated tree to the true tree and ask, you know, how well did our method perform? And in terms of quantifying tree error, we're looking at kind of the false branches of the tree, and we'll be showing an error rate of these incorrect branches. OK, so we basically did a huge comparison study. We looked at multiple, uh, multiple sequence alignment methods. We looked at alignment-free methods, distance methods, maximum likelihood methods. And we took uh, many simulated data sets from a prior paper with 10 replicates for each model condition. And I'll show uh, one of the model conditions today. Uh, but before we get going, uh, I'll show pterodactyl, the effect of iterating. So remember, uh, that process was iterative. You could take the pterodactyl tree, decompose it to get subsets, and repeat that process. And so here we're basically showing that if we come up with a terrible starting tree in a method that's very fast and that you wouldn't want to use in practice, the tree has 71% error, and that in the first iteration of pterodactyl, you drop to 14% error and then it kind of slowly drops down to 11% error. So um, you can give pterodactyl a bad starting tree, and it will make it a lot better, actually, fairly rapidly. And if we compare pterodactyl to alignment-free methods, these are very fast methods that the alignment-free part will give you a distance matrix, and then you can run a method like rapid NJ to get a tree. We're seeing that pterodactyl in blue has a lot lower error than the other two methods in orange and gray. So pterodactyl provides a significant improvement over some of these other HPC implementations that are also alignment-free. And then we compare pterodactyl to two-phase methods. So this method um, takes a multiple sequence alignment. It uses it to get a distance matrix, and then it runs a distance method. And it's important to note that these are both the same distance method, but they're using different input multiple sequence alignments, so one from MAFT and one from PASTA. And so you can see how much that input alignment affects things. And so this kind of is why we didn't want to have to compute a multiple sequence alignment, because PASTA, which is the only method where the tree is very comparable to pterodactyl, actually requires estimating a maximum likelihood tree. And it uses FastTree, which was that tool that was um, shared memory parallel and couldn't run on large n. So even though pterodactyl um, is very similar to this method, although slightly better, we wouldn't really want to do this in practice because it would require uh, running a method that wouldn't scale. And then finally, we compare pterodactyl to maximum likelihood methods. And uh, yes, this method is slightly better than pterodactyl, but we're within 3% very close, and pterodactyl could scale. And we're hoping that with other algorithmic improvements, we can reduce this error. 
And finally, I'd like to note that RaxML is a method that has been cited over 11,000 times, and that's just one of the papers of RaxML. If you talk to anyone in the field related to evolutionary biology, they know what RaxML is, and they probably used it. And so it was really essential to this paper to compare to RaxML and show that pterodactyl is close in accuracy and that maybe with improvements we can get down um, to that low of an error rate. Okay, so in conclusions, we've designed, prototyped, and tested a method that has um, pretty reasonable error in comparison to other leading methods and avoids some of the features uh, that were hard to do well at scale. And for future work, we want to take this prototype and implement it so that it can run on Blue Waters at scale and analyze data sets with millions of sequences and ideally use thousands of nodes. Okay, so why Blue Waters? Um, first off, Blue Waters is really the inspiration for this project. And so by getting access to the machine, we could demonstrate that the existing methods just don't run on large data sets. And so there was a need to solve this problem with a new algorithmic design. And then second, if you want your approach to catch on, you really need to show that it's as good as other leading approaches that are being used by biologists. And the comparison study uh, took less than a month on Blue Waters, but using our four campus cluster nodes, it would have taken greater than a year. And a lot of this time is actually running comparisons to other methods. And that was really critical for demonstrating we've come up with something good that we actually want to implement at scale. Um, the code, so we have a paper under review, and the code is already freely available on GitHub. And just to add, uh, this used just a small part of a general allocation. There were a lot of other research products under that allocation as well. And so, in summary, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my two advisors, Tandy Borno and Bill Gropp. Uh, note again that this project used uh, two allocations and that I've been supported by the National Science Foundation as well as the Cohen Graduate Fellowship in Computer Science.